Scientists have pointed out that if everyone in the world lived as we do in the UK, we'd need three planets to provide the resources and absorb the pollution. And we haven't got three planets, so we need to adapt to one planet living. Writer, photographer and ecologist Elaine Brooke has spent several years experimenting with new ways of adapting her lifestyle and home on the Welsh borders to reduce her carbon footprint. This short film will give you some idea of the work she's doing. Once I started, I began to realise it could become really interesting and a lot of fun. Not at all the way we've been conditioned to believe it's going to be miserable and uncomfortable and rather like living in a wet tent in a field with a bath once a year if you're lucky. Well, I think what brought the whole ecology and health thing to life for me was living and working for 12 years in the Himalaya. Because the people I was working with, I mean, yeah, they'd not got much money and they had to do hard physical work. But they were so healthy and they really knew how to have such a good time. And I think what I sensed was that they had this sense of security, of good friendships. I mean, for example, there was hardly any crime. And then when I came back to this country, there was so much talk about how we've all got to change to more environmental lifestyles. And I just spent 12 years with people who just did it. It, it was normal and it was perfectly enjoyable. It wasn't deprivation. So I thought I'd try and experiment to see how close it was possible to get to all that living here. So the first thing I looked for was uh, a house that I could experiment on, see how uh, close to carbon zero and all the rest of it uh, I could get. I really wanted to save the rainwater off the roof, so I got the builders to set it up so that it goes down off the roof, down the conservatory roof, down the pipe under the terrace, into the wildlife pond, which is why there's always loads of frogs hopping around the garden and eating the slugs. And then it goes out of the pond and it waters the fruit, which makes the fruit nice and juicy. As well, of course, the plants prefer it and it saves on the energy of refining tap water. The heating needs of the house are met with a mixture of passive solar, solar panels and wood-burning stoves. The conservatory acts as a passive solar heater to warm the house and it helps insulate it in the winter. Every time the sun shines, even in winter, there's no need for any heating on in the house. It's also a great place to grow tomatoes and cucumbers and to have breakfast on sunny mornings and this mixes the fun with the practical. The solar panels offset their installation costs quite quickly. These heat the water. I found that the water heating solar panels work really well. I've got sizzling hot water probably about nine months out of the year and for the other three the wood burner's on and the back boiler heats the water. So I've only have to use the immersion heater probably once or twice a year which is really nice. Well you'd never believe it but this is the swimming pool under here all nicely wrapped up in its polytunnel to keep the heat in. It's heated from the excess heat in the solar panels that do the water and I'm hoping it'll make the solar panels last longer because it acts as a heat sink and takes the extra heat out and warms the pool. My theory is, and I think it's, it's working out, is that it saves even more carbon because it stops me wanting to jump on cars and planes and rush off on holiday in foreign countries or somewhere else because it's actually so nice to stay here and I can invite my friends round. Photovoltaic panels produce electricity. These are more expensive and less productive, but they're still worth doing as installing them helps to kickstart a new industry. The wood stoves act as a backup to heat water or for the central heating on cloudy days in the winter. It burns trimmings from the garden and we're not yet self-sufficient in fuel. My biggest challenge is in finding ways to fit enough insulation into an old house that wasn't designed to accommodate it. It would be nice to think that new houses are being built with the right amount, but I'm not sure this is actually happening. When I first came here and the whole house was a building site, I bought my food from local farmers, which was great, but I really wanted to get on with growing my own veg. Apart from anything else, I need the exercise and I don't want to become a couch potato and it makes you get out in the fresh air. And the food's even fresher and tastes even better. And I think my friends really like it as well.
kitchen waste lands up in the compost, of course. It's really useful to include a mix of flowers and wild areas in a garden to encourage pollinating insects and birds and hedgehogs to eat the pests. The reason the pears and herbs are grown next to the compost heaps is so that their deep roots can use the nutrients that wash down from the compost, making them into natural mineral supplements. Several people who visited me said they only had small urban gardens and so they found the ideas hard to relate to on this scale. So I made a small urban sized garden which produces food as well as being nice to sit and relax in. The best way to preserve any surplus is to dry food, but if that's too time consuming, an A-rated freezer is the next best, plus of course buying any extras from the local farmers market rather than produce that's been flown in from abroad. It's much harder in the country than in the city to manage without a vehicle, because what you really need out here is a sort of motorised wheelbarrow. But the compromise I tried was to get it converted to run on 100% recycled chip fat, because it's a plant product and a waste product, so it avoids the problem of the dreadful biofuels that are causing food shortages. The only thing I found was that it does smell a bit like a flying chip shop, but you do sort of get used to it. The most useful thing I've learned is to make sure I continue to feel intrigued and challenged rather than guilty about the bits still left to sort out. And I focus on having fun and celebrating the successes and swapping useful information with people engaged in their own One Planet Living experiment. And I hope this will also encourage you to start your own experiment to reduce your carbon footprint. Mm -hmm.